Good morning, everyone. My name is Lauren Zabrick, and I am the executive director of the Cyber Project. I want to welcome everyone here to our event today. I'm really excited about it. Um, first, uh, just a couple of things about um, the event itself. Um, this is a webinar format, and so I will go ahead and introduce our two panels today and then turn it over to them for their presentation. And then we'll open it up to question and answer period, but please use the question and answer function to actually ask your question. Um, just please keep in mind that this meeting is being recorded. However, while this virtual event is on the record, the event organizers, so myself, uh, Tara and Lord John Alderdice, prohibit any attendees, including journalists from audio and visual recording or distributing parts or all of the event program without prior written authorization. So today at the Cyber Project, we are joined by two amazing guests, Tara Wheeler and Lord John Alderdice to present their research, which looks at the Geneva Convention and two recent international cyber events, WannaCry and NotPetya. As we look more and more to cyber norms on the international stage, this is an important discussion to have, and I'm excited to introduce our panelists. First, Tara Wheeler is a Cyber Project Fellow at the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs. She's an International Security Fellow at New America, leading a new international cybersecurity capacity building project with the Hewlett Foundation Cyber Initiative, and is a US, UK Fulbright Scholar in Cybersecurity for this year. She is an Electronic Frontier Foundation Advisory Board member, an inaugural contributing cybersecurity expert for the Washington Post, and a foreign policy contributor on cyber warfare. She has appeared on Bloomberg Asia on US-China trade and cybersecurity. She is the author of the best-selling Women in Tech, Take Your Career to the Next Level with Practical Advice and Inspiring Stories. And she is an information security researcher, political scientist in the area of international conflict, uh, author and a poker player. She's been the head of offensive security and technical data privacy at Splunk and a senior director of engineering and principal security advocate at Semantic Website Security. She's led projects at Microsoft Game Studios and architected systems at encrypted uh, mobile communication firm Silent Circle. She's spoken on information security at the European Union, at the Malaysian Security Commission for Foreign, Foreign Policy, the OECD and the FTC, uh, and also at universities like Stanford, American, West Point, and Oxford. Um, she's also uh, an incredible expert in um, and has won a lot in the World Series of Poker. And you can see her on Twitter at, at Tara. Next, we have Lord John Alderdice. In 1996, when Lord John Alderdice was elevated to the House of Lords, he was one of the youngest ever life appointees to the House. Since then, he has served as an active Liberal Democrat member of the House. From 2013, he has also been the director of the Center for Resolution of Intractable Conflict, based at the University of Oxford. From 1987 to 1998, Lord Alderdice was leader of the Northern Ireland, Ireland's Alliance Par Party and one of the negotiators of the Good Friday Agreement. He was then the first speaker of the new Northern Ireland Assembly until 2004, when he was appointed one of four international commissioners charged with overseeing security normalization in Ireland. From 2005 to 2009, he was president of the Liberal International, the global family of more than 100 liberal political parties. And from 2010 to 2014, he was chair of the Liberal Democratic Parliamentary Par Party in the House of Lords. He is currently a deputy to the Lord Speaker of the House of Lords and a member of the Special Committee on COVID-19. He's retired as a doctor and psychiatrist, but continues as a senior research fellow at Harris Manchester College which at the University of Oxford to work, lecture, and write on the psychology of fundamentalism, radicalization, terrorism, and intractable political violence. He has been recognized with many prizes, honorary degrees, fellowships for his international contributions. So we can learn a lot from both of our guests today. So with that, I would love to turn it over to Tara to kick us off. Thank you so much, Lauren. It is an honor and a pleasure to be here today. It is also strange. Uh, we are in a world right now where we're so inter interconnected by the internet and yet uh, in, in this world where we're so connected, it's hard to feel connected to other people. So I do want to especially reach out to the people who 
are here today and say, I can't see your faces right now, but I'm so incredibly glad that you're here. I look forward to hearing from you, your questions, your thoughts on this, and uh, with, with hopefully a, a spirit of profound humility and as a student of this, I'd love to tell you more about why we're here today, why I and Lord Alderdice are having this conversation with you about international law, cyber attacks, and why precisely a, a, a hacker and a peer got together to have a conversation about high frequency, low level conflict over time. So the reason this uh, this conversation began was it's it's actually thanks to a, a dear friend of mine, um, Marshall Hoffman, who said about a year ago, Tara, you know, actually it's come to think about it close to a year and a half ago now. She said, you should think about having a conversation about going and doing some work for the Fulbright folks in cybersecurity. And I said, don't they like academics and extremely important people for that. I'm just a dirty hacker. <laughs> she said, I bet they want to have a conversation with you. It's important now to, to look at, at how these kinds of attacks are created and built. And for that, we need the kind of people who take this, this technology apart and talk about it. And I said, okay, I'll give it a shot. And highly improbably, uh, here I am at the University of Oxford having conversations with the National Health Service at the, uh, in the United Kingdom and collecting stories very specifically uh, for the next two months on people that have been impacted by WannaCry, specifically that week, uh, that incredibly horrific week in 2017 that I think so many of us in information security remember at this point, uh, much like that story about how everyone remembers where they were when Kennedy got shot. So many of us in information security remember what we were doing the day we heard about WannaCry, that week of no sleep, and what it was like to try to, to keep people safe and keep systems going. Well, in the, in the UK at the NHS, uh, people didn't just figuratively suffer, they literally suffered from the kind of attack that shut down hospitals, um, specifically targeted, of course, using Eternal Blue um, hospital facilities. And, uh, and, and it, the devastation here was just extraordinary in terms of information security, incident response, and the kinds of people that were impacted, never knowing that they could be that impacted by a North Korean nation state attack on uh, the globe, but primarily on the United States. So here I am, and we're having this conversation as I uh, collaborate with Lord Alderdice on what warfare in cyberspace looks like why it is targeted towards civilians, why it bypasses military installations and networks and goes straight for reaving away uh, the, the security, safety, financial and medical health of civilians in countries that have the exposure to the internet but not necessarily the, the capacity to defend themselves. And so why are we having this conversation here today? We have, heard an incredible amount of debate over the idea of what a Geneva Convention would look like in cyberspace. And one of the things that I've come to realize over time is that if we're not abiding by the laws we already have, then there's a question that just sort of exists out there. Why would we make new ones? Why would we try to disrupt international law with some brand new laws in cyberspace if we're not able as nation states to come together and follow the laws we've already created? To understand why this matters, let's take a little bit of a look at what the two major cyber attacks that we'll be talking about today did. The first attack that I want to talk about is WannaCry. Of course, we know that it had an impact here in the United Kingdom, especially in the NHS. But we also know about an attack called NotPetya that occurred in 2017 as well, um, very close to the time that WannaCry came out. And both used um, a technique that was released from a trove of tools that was captured and released by a, um, a group of hackers called uh, the Shadow Brokers in late 2016 and early 2017. The nature of those tools included, the, um, included a series of exploits, not necessarily what we would call an ODE vulnerability, which would be something that is undiscovered by companies and, um, and, and remains out there to yet to be discovered, a vulnerability in software that hasn't been used yet or exploited yet. Um, and what these attacks did was made use of ODE exploits, which can be not just something that companies don't know about yet, 
but could also just be a string of well-known exploits that have been tied together in what we call a kill chain. This is closer to that. It's closer to using the kinds of tools that already exist out there in a new and fairly horrifying combination to attack people. So the first attack I want to take a look at here as I, as I talk about NotPetya, an attack by the, uh, the Russian intelligence services versus the Ukraine in early 2017 that targeted the Ukrainian power grid. This attack was designed to uh, interact with, infest, and take down the power grid in uh, Kiev in the middle of the winter. Now, the attack that was created by the Russians, this, this concept, this not Petya, this worm that was, that was used to exploit the Kievan power grid, was a uh, was built on that same trove of tools that WannaCry is built on, the ones that were released by the Shadow Brokers. What I'd like to do is I'd like to show you two pictures of code right now. And I'm going to go ahead and share, if I possibly can here, a picture of what NotPetya looks like. This is NotPetya. You can take a look and see what uh, encrypting individual pieces of code looks like. If you see this screenshot from the code that's been reversed and, re and recreated, this is a pretty clearly uh, not just the code, but it's somebody who has um, who has disassembled it and then taken a look at how it's put together to uh, in, encrypt files in a loop. So you can see here as you as you look through what this loop looks like, um, that that chunk right at the very top that says, if this thing hasn't happened yet, take a look and see if you can do it. If you can do it, do it. And then move through this loop. If it's not yet been done, do it, encrypt it. While I can still find more of this code, keep doing it. And then if you can't find any more of it, move on to the next process. This, this process, this nation state attack created by, uh, by Russian associated hackers and, and uh, certainly attributed to Russia is an elegant weapon from a more civilized age. It really is. It's a beautiful piece of code. It's dangerous. It's a katana uh, and it's well done. As opposed to, I'd love to show you something here. This is WannaCry. It was targeted by North Korea at the United States, and this is what ended up harming the NHS. This right here is a mess. It's a wreck. It's stormtroopers everywhere, and it's not done well, but it's done so thoroughly that it's um, that it is just you can't get rid of it. It's the if the for, if the former weapon is a katana, this is mustard gas, right? You can see here the mess that was WannaCry. You can even take a look down here at this highlighted piece that I've shown down here, the local underscore 6C with this function right here. It says warning subroutine doesn't return. That's from the original code. This was written by folks that, uh, that didn't necessarily need to be elegant in how they were writing it. And it was released without care or thought for what it could do. That's why this is a question of, of irresponsibly potentially targeting civilians. When you look at this code, it tells you that the people who created it targeted it without thought and released it without fear of consequences. When that is done by the military of any country towards civilians in another country, it falls under the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, Article 7 and Article 8, possibly. Article 7 is crimes against humanity. Article 8 is war crimes. This being targeted indiscriminately against health organizations that hurt people, I believe strongly at this point could very easily be described as a war crime against a civilian population. It's why I care about this. And seeing civilians targeted by weapons like this is the reason that we're having this conversation today. Now, if we're going to have a conversation about law, we need to talk about why we're not following the ones we already have. Now, as someone who has been working on this, this problem for a while, it's, it's important to me to reach to other disciplines, to talk to people who've had other experiences with this kind of conflict targeted at civilians over time. So I would absolutely love to turn this over to somebody who might have a little bit of an understanding about what it's like to deal with low level, high frequency conflict targeted at civilians. So thank you so much for this. I'd love to turn it over to Lord Alderdice if you'd like to, to continue on with the conversation about why we're talking here. Thank you very much indeed, Tara, and thanks both to, to you, and uh, we're getting uh, to know each other and to work together in Oxford, which is uh, marvellous. And thanks to Lauren for facilitating uh, today's webinar. 
I was interested when Tara got in touch with me because uh, I've been used to working in a form of warfare where the law is not a solution, and that is in terrorism. You see, in Northern Ireland, the part of the world that I originally come from, we had experienced a terrorist campaign for a quarter of a century, which was just the latest version of hostilities that had been going on in the island of Ireland for hundreds of years. And the most recent version of the fight was between the majority of people who live in the north of the island who want to remain part of the United Kingdom, mostly Protestant by religion and Scottish and English by culture, and those minority in the north and majority in the south who want the island to be separated off as a whole, southern part has been separated since the beginning of the 20th century, but for the whole of the island to be independent of Britain. And the majority of those people are Catholic and nationalists and have a different approach to culture and, and, and understanding society historically and one might even argue in some sense of psychological, certainly a different identity as well as different loyalties. And the problem that I faced whenever I became involved with this was that the normal explanations didn't work. The normal explanation was that people get themselves involved in violence and war because they perceive it to be in the best socioeconomic and power interests. And what was quite clear was that this was not in anybody's best interest. Everybody was being harmed by it. It was also the case that the law wasn't working. It's not that the rule of law didn't exist. The laws were there, they were very clear. And indeed, they were very clear even in protecting people who involved themselves in terrorism. It wasn't legal to simply shoot somebody because they had a gun. Um, and you had to arrest them, have evidence, take them to court, uh, convict them, uh, put them in prison for whatever was the appropriate amount of time, and so on and so on. And this went on for quite a while. And, and the view of many people uh, was that, you know, if you applied the law and you applied it in a fair way and respected human rights and all of these kinds of things, that uh, it would bring it to a close because it was, after all, illegal. Well, it didn't work. And it didn't work because those people who were engaged in terrorism weren't oblivious to the fact that they were breaking the law as the law was laid down. They simply believed that they were fulfilling a higher law, a higher moral code, if you like. Oh, yes, we know the law says this and this and this, but all the law has done is assist those who are oppressing us from a political point of view or are controlling territory we don't believe that they ought to have or whatever. And we've tried to get rid of them, uh, but we've not been able to. So we are obeying a different kind of law, a higher law, a law that is our loyalty to our religion, to our fellow citizens that are part of our community, as distinct from those citizens who do, we do not feel are part of our community. And this, of course, is a, an, an approach that has been used for a long time, but became really quite sophisticated in the later part of the 19th and early 20th century. But as the century went on, other things began to happen too, because although we'd been fighting on land for a very long time and on sea for a very long time, and certainly since the First World War, uh, in the air and more recently in space, all of these were spaces that human beings could inhabit, but they existed before. They were always there. We weren't able to go into space, but it was still there. So we didn't create space, but we were able to ha inhabit it. And when human beings can inhabit a space, they can agree with each other and they can work together and they can enjoy it or they can fight about it. And they can disagree about how they're going to share the space, whether they really want to share the space with other people who have a different perspective. But more recently, we had a new space created, the one that Tara was talking about, cyberspace, which was not something that existed before it was created by human beings. But there is eggs or eggs. If it happened to be there, human beings would find a way of fighting with each other in it, as well as in cooperating. Initially, of course, when the internet was created, there was a great sense of uh, enthusiasm that here was an opportunity that we could cooperate across the globe. We could do all sorts of things together. We could have all sorts of knowledge available to us and everything would be absolutely marvelous. And oppressive authoritarian governments couldn't stop it because the internet was available everywhere. Well, 
a number of problems emerged, of course. One of them was that the people who were most adept at using the internet weren't nice, liberal, tolerant people who wanted to educate and inform. They were people who wanted to do organized crime or pedophile pornography or conduct war, conduct violent attacks. Not necessarily violent in the way that we were used to, that is to say, not necessarily going out and shooting and bombing people, but making life very difficult for people in such a way that society wouldn't work and it would break down and then you could exert your own kind of control. And, and most recently, there's been another way in which this has developed. So, for example, if you go back five or ten years ago, when you were wanting to use cyber to promote your way to defeat the other guy, you would, of course, use lots of different techniques. But when it came to the argument, you would try to get your argument out there, persuade people with tweets or maybe used Facebook or some other kind of platform. And, and the, the job was really to persuade people of your message, get more tweets out, more persuasive tweets, ones that would make people change their mind and support you as over against another person. Well, then the other side would do the same thing and you'd have this great struggle. But it wasn't fundamentally different from the struggles that were there previously, except that instead of doing them on paper or in newspapers or broadcasting or other kinds of propaganda, you could now use the internet. But more recently, a much cleverer and more destructive way of operating has emerged. So what you do is you take a liberal society. What does a liberal society do? Well, what it, it takes the view that debate is good, that we disagree with each other, but that's marvelous because if we disagree with each other and we engage in an argument, and I listen to what you have to say, you listen to what I have to say, then something new can emerge from that, something that is more than I know and more than you know, it can emerge from that. And maybe, maybe what I'm saying is not right, or maybe what you're saying is not right, maybe but neither of us is saying right, maybe something new will emerge from all of that. So that was the, the, the great strength, the great enthusiasm in the liberal world was for debate and discussion and argument and disagreement that could come. However, there was a fatal assumption in this. And the assumption was that fundamentally we are rational beings. And that if we hear an argument that's different from and conflicts with the argument that we're putting forward, we will listen, we'll take it seriously, and we will change our perspective and our view. Because after all, it's all about rationality. But of course, that's not the truth. Even in somewhere like Harvard, people can get very attached to their own theories and their own ideas. And when you show them that their ideas are wrong, they don't immediately abandon them. They try to prove that, well, actually, they may not be perfectly right, but here's a little tweak that would make it right. And by the way, it's also better than your argument. And so all sorts of emotional investments are there. Well, this is the vulnerability. And those who decided to use the internet realized we don't actually need to put out our messages in order to overcome the messages of the other guys. In fact, what we can do is we can promote their messages and we can promote the other side's messages. And if we really promote them enormously, use bots, use all sorts of, of, uh, of, the, of techniques that are available to us using computers. We don't, have to, we don't have to create all these messages ourselves. We just take the messages that are already there and we amplify them, increase them by a huge factor. And the more we do that, the more these go around, the more people get worked up and excited and angry and upset. And so what you do is you create deeper and deeper divisions, not deeper understanding from engagement in a rational argument, but deeper divisions as people become overwhelmed with these communications in cyberspace. And that's exactly what has happened. And what we find now, if you look at the United States, the part of the world that most of the listeners here will come from, or any other part of the world, what you will find is deeper division, more polarization and fragmentation, the more the argument goes out in cyberspace in these mechanized manners. If, if you're wanting to put your view forward, you'll sit down, you'll write a column, you'll try to get it into the newspaper, it will take you forever, you'll have to try all sorts of different places. But if you can take this technique, 
you can have tens of thousands of bots multiplying this, not in order to enlighten people or engage in debate, but to deepen and increase angry, frustrated, fearful difference. And the consequences of that are enormous. The other thing finally to say is that in the past, for much of the time, people, and it was more often than not men, went off to war. And war was something that happened over there. And if it came here, that was, that was unusual and you had a huge reaction to it. 9-11 was exactly like that. All of this stuff is happening in the other part of the world. And then it comes to our part of the world. My goodness, we have a huge reaction to that. But of course, the thing about war in cyberspace is that it isn't over there. It's everywhere. It's in your own computer. It's in your home. There is no going away to war. It comes to you and it infests all your systems. Now, the great strength, for example, in the United Kingdom of our health system is what has been seen in the pandemic. We're able to get the health system, the academic system at Oxford University, and the business people at AstraZeneca, and we're able to produce a vaccine and produce it very quickly. And the National Health Service, because it's organized on a nationwide basis, can get those vaccines out marvelously. So we've got more than 18 million people out of a total population in excess of 16 million. So way over 30% of all the adults in our population have already been had their first vaccine and they'll have their second one before very long. Great strength, but therein is the vulnerability. Just like the great strength of liberal argument and debate, which is turned into its weakness. So what Tara has tell, been telling you is that the great strength of our health system, that it was available to everybody at no cost, organized right across the community, then becomes our vulnerability because it's impossible to isolate yourself off from the attack. So when we're making a presentation quite often in academic areas like this, you present your research in order to demonstrate that you found the answer to the problem. But I'm afraid this isn't one of those situations. This is one where we're presenting you with the problem because it's a really serious problem. And it's not that we've got some simple answer. In fact, what we're saying is those things that people thought were answers, like the rule of law, don't really quite work in the same way. If you don't have a global policing service, if you don't have a global system of justice, if you don't have global respect for the rule of law, and that even our own countries at times, when it comes to international law, transgress what has been accepted and agreed as international law, then these normal mechanisms, the rule of law, the administration of justice, the policing service, don't work perfectly domestically, but increasingly don't work at all internationally. So we're presenting you, I'm afraid, with a problem because we need all the ability and all the brains and all the humanity that we can to try to make sure that we make our way through this problem and aren't swallowed up by it. Thank you. All right, thank you for that discussion. Um, so let's, um, I'm gonna start off with some questions for, uh, for our panelists, but please, if you have a question, um, please type it into the Q&A box. I'd love to hear from you. Um, so first, I just sort of want to ask, you know, Tara, you know, when you were looking at the code from these two uh, pieces of malware, um, you know, something that we've talked a little bit about in, you know, the sort of our elbow, elbow group discussions, those are um, uh, track two dialogue. Um, and then also, you know, in a, in a paper that we're trying to write, um, we're thinking about how to agree to limit or even ban the use of indiscriminate malware. And so I'm wondering, you know, from just a very technical level, um, is there a way to, uh, to not make the, you know, such destructive malware indiscriminate and, um, you know, affect civilians like this? Obviously with, you know, NotPetya, if it's focused on an actual power grid, you know, that's, that's something, you know, else entirely. Um, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. When I first looked 
at these at these particular weapons, because they are weapons, right? Anything can become a weapon if you use it against someone else. It doesn't matter if it's a tea kettle. I don't care if it's a pencil. I don't care if it's a nuclear weapon. Anything that is used with, with malice to harm someone else can become a weapon. And that includes Python and Ada and all of the tools that we use to make the world better and more interconnected. You can turn anything to an ill purpose with, the, with, with that kind of malicious intent. And when I say that that I look at these weapons and and I say something like not Petra was elegant, that it was a katana, that doesn't mean that I don't. It doesn't mean that I d I don't feel horror when I look at it because I I see when I look at that code, forty percent of the world's shipping capacity dead in the water, uh, and the the Maersk story about food rotting and medications not getting to their intended car uh, uh, ports of call around the world. That's what that weapon did. It, it took down small businesses, killed shipping concerns, took down uh, pharmaceutical companies. And the kind of, the kind of it, it, um, it, it causes me the most profound sorrow to see something that could have been that beautiful turn to such a, a, a horrifying end. I am I'm horrified on an existential level by that and I'm angered by WannaCry. I'm angered by WannaCry because it was indiscriminate. Not Petra was elegant and well done and it was intended to do what it did. And it was hidden inside the concept of ransomware that would it would not permit it to be unlocked, right? WannaCry was almost more a mistake. It was almost intended to uh, to, to be more a ransomware and, and simply create indiscriminate harm wherever it landed. I'm I'm I am fearful of NotPetya and I'm disgusted by WannaCry. And when I call them the difference between a katana and mustard gas, what I'm doing is I'm referring to a kind of weapon. When I see people talk about digital Geneva conventions or, and I don't want to point out that particular phrase uh, in particular, I'm talking about a, a, a question of whether or not we need to make new laws that focus on the, um, the focus specifically in cyberspace as opposed to abiding by the laws we already have. When I look at these kinds of weapons and say to myself, do we need new laws or do we need to abide by the ones we already have? I look to a couple of examples. First of all, I look at the American Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, which doesn't actually, it, it doesn't help much in the United States. And most people I, I know would, would describe the CFAA as a broken law that needed to be sunsetted a long time ago, that in, in essence, essentially um, recreates what it means to commit fraud under US code and just does it in a way that makes it really abusable by prosecutors, frankly, and, and a problem in our, in our legal system. I look at the Chemical Weapons Convention of 1993 and say to myself, do we need to have the, the world sign a chemical weapons convention, but one that is intended for cyber? It's an interesting question. I think the, um, that is open to debate. I think revisiting the concept of the kinds of international laws we've already created and trying to disrupt those and create new ones instead of stacking on top of the ones we've already built to clarify or improve in the future is, is the thing that I want to argue against when you and I have this conversation and, we, and when all of us talk about how we want to both abide by international law and see it progress. I don't believe we need to go back in time and say that we need to make up new moral laws for cybersecurity that we didn't make up for the Geneva Conventions. We may possibly have a conversation one day about a cyber weapons convention like the one that is that was signed in 93 for chemical weapons. But trying to say that there is a fundamental difference in, in warfare that happens in cyberspace that does not happen in a maritime sense, on a ground-based sense, in space, in air, that's the problem that we're having here. Because it's like going back and trying to recreate what it means to commit fraud if you just do it with a keyboard. So this is the, this is the perspective that I come from and, and the reason why the, the, the conversations that Lord Allardyce and I have about whether or not law still works is, is why I care about this. And I would actually, I'd, I'd love to hear your opinion on this one, John. Do you, can you tell me what you think? Of, should we have a cyber weapons convention like the chemical weapons convention? If I can hijack Lauren's question, this is, this is great. I wanna know. <laughs> I think the problem that you have about mm -hmm. weapons conventions is first of all, that the reason you can have an agreement between states on something like intercontinental ballistic nuclear missiles or or even chemical weapons is that there's a degree of sophistication in their production that requires state involvement 
you know, there's a lot of talk about terrorist organizations using nuclear devices. It's actually extremely difficult for a terrorist organization to even produce a fissile device, which, which would not be a weapon of mass effect or even mass destruction in comparison with the nuclear bomb, for example. It's very, it's very complex, expensive, difficult to do if you don't have control of a, of a, a nation state with the capacity to do that. So the difference when you're using cyber weapons is that these literally are weapons that they can be created by somebody in their basement with a computer and internet access. So it's a completely different kind of business. And the second reason is because when you have negotiations between international players, and it takes quite a long time to agree all of these kinds of things, there's some kind of assumption that they're doing it with the intention of abiding by them. What has become clear in recent times is that that is no longer the case, that, that states are prepared to sign up for things that they have no intention of implementing. And in fact, on the contrary, they are absolutely prepared to at least wink at or hide their eyes from what some of their quote allies are doing, if not actually to get those allies to do things on their behalf. So it, it, this, is, this is a very different situation from that where you had weapons that could only be produced by major nation states, which they were prepared to negotiate about and agree not to use except in certain limited extreme circumstances and then to hold each other to account through the multilateral system where you have every, anybody that can use a computer anybody that's a smart enough hacker and you know lots of them anybody like that who has internet access anywhere in the world can produce a weapon that can take down some of the most sophisticated operations there are and in addition to that there are some states that are perfectly happy for that to be done and, and, and not to try to attack them or take them down or protect others from them because it's useful to them. Now, that, that principle is not in itself wholly new. I mean, if you look, for example, in, in this part of the world, we remember Sir Francis Drake, who defeated the Spanish Armada. But one of the reasons the Spanish Armada was sent was because King Philip got fed up with his ships full of gold from what we now call Latin America being ambushed by pirates, one of the chief of which was Francis Drake, who was ambushing these ships and taking the gold back to Queen Elizabeth of England. And so eventually Philip got fed up and decided we're going to go to a proper war here and I'm going to send these boats and I'm going to invade this place because they're a pest and they're not behaving in what even then he would have thought was a legal way. So it's not wholly new that states are prepared to use uh, ultra vires means, uh, but it's the ease with which it can be done by any individual in the basement of their house that makes it very difficult to use the normal processes of international negotiations, treaties and conventions. Great, thank you. Um, we do have a question um, from Professor Joe Nye and I'm gonna let him uh, ask it live because it's Professor Joe Nye. <laughs> um, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, allow you to talk, uh, Professor Nye. Uh, thank you, Lauren. I, I thought this was a very interesting presentation, and I am very sympathetic with the, the objective of something like a Geneva Convention for Cyber. I did serve as a member of the Global Commission on Stability in Cyberspace, but I keep getting objections from friends um, saying that uh, my interest in norms for cyberspace is uh, totally misplaced. Uh, and the, they often cite the example of the UN group of government experts in 2015, which came out with 11 norms, uh, which included not attacking civilian infrastructure. Russia signed that in 2015. And then it almost immediately attacked Ukraine's civilian infrastructure and brought down the grid in the, uh, December of 2015. So long before uh, NotPetya and long before solar winds, we've seen a consistent behavior in which Russia just uh, doesn't 
uh, uh, perform. Uh, so are we kidding ourselves to think that setting up a norm will, uh, or Geneva Convention will do any good? Or if we do, is it just essentially restricting us and the good guys, while the bad guys then have an even freer hair than ever? Um, I'd be curious to know how you reply to these people who object to me and my efforts on behalf of norms. Well, Please. I, I'm, I'm very happy to, to respond to that. First of all, I'm very honored by your participation, Professor Nye. And I have enormous sympathy with the challenge that you raised to this. I think you're absolutely right. Uh, and it's, this, is, this is now a fundamental problem for us. If we are in a place where the international community, um, at, at least in part, and arguably more widely than we would like to believe, does not agree to live by the rules of international law, then producing some more international rules is not going to solve the problem. And this means that we, we it doesn't mean that you dump the rules that you've got, uh, and it doesn't mean that you don't try to negotiate new ones, which will act as a kind of um, marker for what is decent and good and honourable international behaviour. There is, there is some value in doing those kinds of things. But I think it's clear that we've come to the, to, to the limits and, in a sense, gone beyond the limits of an expectation that international conventions and international law, which is somewhat different from domestic law in all sorts of ways, but that, that is going to solve our problem. Uh, and indeed, I came to this conclusion quite some time ago when it became clear to me that those sorts of things didn't work in, for example, the Northern Ireland context. The rule of law, uh, you could implement it till the cows come home, as we would say in Ireland, uh, but it didn't actually bring the, the, the war to an end, didn't solve the problem. And indeed, when you put people away in prison, in the end, when you find a way out of it, they had to be released from prison because the rule of law itself did not work in such circumstances. And what we had to do was construct a very different way of thinking about these things, which was to think about what led people to break the laws that were there. And we came to the conclusion that it was about disturbed relationships amongst communities and not just disturbed relationships in the here and now between different communities, but disturbed historic relationships which meant that people were attacking because of how they had been treated. And so, for example, if I could have the precise situation that you refer to, that of, of, of Russia, um, people like Vladimir Putin and, and, and those around him um, have not forgiven us uh, that at the end of the Cold War, instead of saying, well, thank goodness, those hostilities have ended, now let's work together to create a new global order, and you, Russia, must be a key feature of that because you're so important. Instead of that, the message that went out was, we won the Cold War, you lost it, your system was garbage, and, and, and you need to adopt our way of thinking about the world and working at the world. And some of these people uh, have never forgiven or forgotten that, and they are determined to do whatever they can to wreak revenge and havoc. And the only way of dealing with that would have been to try to construct a new set of relationships. And that's much more difficult now than it would have been to have tried to make that effort at the end of the, of the Cold War. So I think you're absolutely right. I think you point up the limits. It's not that there's no value, but you point up the limits of the law. Uh, and, and we know it in our personal relationships. Just because two people sign a piece of paper that says they're contractually married to each other does not mean they have good relationships. They may be, they may be handcuffed together to make each other miserable for the rest of their lives if they choose to do so. So the whole business of relationships is not... Uh, is not, there is a limit to the law. Uh, and I think we've come to that in the international community. Tara, I'd love to hear from you now. Uh, thank you. And I'm, I'm going to agree with everything that John just said, and also Professor Nye, it, it, uh, it actually turns out I can still feel stage fright. So thanks for that experience today. <laughs> I appreciate it. Uh, I, I heard what you, uh, what you are, are asking about. And, and as somebody who was looking at what happened to the Ukrainian power grid, and, and knew about the exact same norms and conventions that you're describing here, I asked myself the exact same question. And I think I would answer that with a reference back to 1928 and the Kellogg-Briand Pact. Uh, and I would say that just because it sounds facile to make war illegal doesn't mean we don't try. If we don't encode norms 
in, in our international system. If we don't say what a good system does look like, we're not able to code people willing to break those norms. Unless we say what a norm is and agree to abide by it, we can't differentiate ourselves from those who are willing to break it. And the value sometimes in laying down, I, I would say, the law in a case like this is even if we cannot always force nation states to abide by what we would wish them to do, especially given, so a great comment from Pablo Brewer out there, uh, that we are not necessarily dealing with the Westphalian state at the moment, that this is existing beyond national borders through and without and within and around us, that uh, just because we can't make a perfect system, just because we don't have one now doesn't mean we should give up on the concept. At the same time, the idea that creating a new digital Geneva Convention that is somehow different than the than the laws we already have, uh, I think you're absolutely correct. It doesn't change the fact that that we've already identified the norm breakers in our international system. There is work to be done in international law. I'm not saying give up on it. At the same time, um, we find value in identifying our threat model and our attack surface and the vectors from where we can identify potential threats. And sometimes that comes from the people who've demonstrated that they're willing to attack civilians in their homes. Thank you. Um, and Lord Alderdice, I, you know, I, I thought your point was really interesting. In some ways, you know, I, I was thinking, um, you know, to your point, I wonder if, you know, we sort of declared the Cold War was over, but you know, did, did Russia, you know, and, and I wonder if it's still, you know, it, kind of that mindset, if you will. So that's something that I've been thinking about a lot. Um, and I know we have a couple of questions, but I just want to kind of make the point too, is, you know, I wonder, and we don't have to answer this now, but I wonder, um, you know, would a sort of bilateral agreement, you know, be something to pursue. That's something that we are exploring as well, instead of sort of this, you know, multinational, multilateral, you know, uh, norms agreements, but, um, you know, on, on just a country to country level, you know, maybe that's, um, you know, something to, something to explore, basically. Um, but uh, definitely hear your points on that for both of you. Um, so we have a, a, a bunch more questions. So I want to get to them when we have about uh, 12 minutes left. Um, so we have a question that asks, um, do you think that deliberate online falsehoods, so misinformation, for instance, could potentially be a war crime that requires regulation? Um, how could that be done? And, and what are some of the key principles there? I think in a way, this question almost raises the sort of problem that we've developed for ourselves. And that is, um, that that everything is made into a war and and a, a huge international response and calamity is 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 necessary um people are telling things that aren't true that that should be a war crime the, the problem about this is that um, everything is huge and therefore nothing means anything anymore I mean, I've just been listening to the amount of money that our government has been borrowing to deal with the pandemic, and the idea that my uh, overdraft is of any significance sort of kind of disappears. And I think we need to be very careful if, if, if people are uh, you know, using fake news or misinforming people or telling lies or whatever, that's important, it's serious, and we should try to find a way of addressing it. But to start talking about it as a war crime, it seems to me uh, you, you've got to be really, really careful about that. Now, there is an argument that some of the things that have been done uh, have led to results on civilian populations of such an enormity that the consequences uh, could be regarded as a war crime. And I think that's a really interesting conversation to have. But I think there is a danger about, about uh, speaking about you know, fake news or misinformation or whatever as a war crime. It's, 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 it's bad behavior and sorts of things, but I don't know that we should do that. But I do think that actually, what we need to think about in that context is, well, if it's not true, why do people believe it? Why do so many people in the United States, for example, believe a lot of stuff where, where it's been demonstrated they're not, it's not true, it's not factually correct? And I think the answer to that, and you would expect a psychiatrist to say this, the answer to that is because it may not be factually true in a cognitive sense, 
but emotionally it feels true to people because it represents how they feel and where they're at. And they feel a degree of authenticity to their experience, to their feelings, to their disturbed, unhappy, angry, aggressive, whatever kinds of feelings. And therefore, it has that truth for them. And for them, that is a more important truth than the cognitive evidential truth that, uh, that, that other people might say, well, that's, it's important that we pay attention to that. So I, I think we need to understand that, for example, when you try to say to people, but that's not true, look, I fact check. And they'll say to you, you don't get it really, do you? I don't care. That's not the issue for me. Um, in the same kind of way as one of the reasons that, that David Cameron lost the Brexit referendum was that he tried to argue on the question of whether in economic factual terms we would be better off or not better off. It was a completely pointless argument because the people who were voting for Brexit weren't voting for it for economic reasons. They had another set of feelings that were connected with it, and that was the driver for them. So I think we have to be... We have to be careful that we don't magnify things to the point where they're not workable with, and instead try to dig in and understand what is it that's at the back of these things. I'd love to jump in on that too, and not only agree with you that we need to dig in more deeply, but argue that there is a technical difference between disinformation and an act of war in cyberspace. The technical difference, I, I am not as familiar, obviously, with UK law as I would be with the United States, but the technical difference in the United States is the difference between US Code 50 and US Code 10. US Code 50 governs espionage, US Code 10 governs the, govern, governs the laws of war. When I speak to friends of mine who have worn polo shirts and badges in places where an enter key means deception and destruction on foreign shores at the hit of an enter key, they describe to me the moment of a, of a cyber attack, something that goes from Article 50 under US code, uh, something that involves listening, paying attention to being, uh, being in someone else's network, to an act that actually changes something on foreign shores. They describe that moment technically as the moment at which the enter key is depressed on a keyboard executing a script that engages in deception and destruction on foreign shores. That is the moment in time, the, the technical moment and the millisecond at which we move from Title 50 to Title 10. To say that disinformation can be an act of war is problematic. It can be horrific. It can be something that damages the cognitive security, the emotional status, the health of a society. But we need to call things by their right names. And calling things by their right names is part of what gets us, gets us to truth and understanding of clarity in law, as opposed to letting a fug of misinformation cloud around what constitutes espionage and a cyber attack. There's a reason technical experts have been trying to explain that SolarWinds was not an act of war. It was an act of espionage. It was an espionage operation that, as far as I still know, has not created a single direct dollar of damage or caused a single person to, to uh, have one fingernail broken over the course of that operation. That's different, fundamentally different than not Pecha and Wanna Cry, which destroyed people's ability to eat and get medical care. Those are fundamentally different things and we need to keep them separate to call things by their right name and dig into the technical meaning of what we say when we say something is an act of war. I'm so glad that you you brought that distinction up, Tara. Um, you know, I think in in the discussion about that particular operation, um, you know, it occurred to me that I think you know we use the term cyber attack I think too loosely, um, and so you know, especially in the public where I think a lot of people you know might not understand the nuances of those terms. So I'm really glad that you you actually brought that up. Um, I have a, a question for you from um, one of our anonymous attendees. Um, can we, what, what, what do we need to do to prove intentionality in the application of international law to cyber? Um, you know, should it be applied to ac accidental attacks? For example, would we apply it to the 1988 Morris worm? That's a fascinating one. Uh, so the Morris worm, th this is interesting. Is there intentionality behind something that's called an attack? Um, I don't think anyone would argue that the Morris worm was not an attack. It was um, an escaped contagion, might be a better way to put it. That doesn't mean there's no responsibility that needed to be allocated. And 
there's certainly, you know, the, the war stories of those folks who were doing incident response. And the first time we really had that kind of incident response in an all hands on deck situation in InfoSec. But I think that there's certainly, um, when, when someone screws up and there's no intentionality, that doesn't mean that reparations aren't due. It doesn't mean that there's not a cleanup effort. Um, it does mean that we need to be, it's part of the reason I say we need to be careful about calling things by their right names. Because if someone has done something and requests assistance from the international community, and it's clear that it was an escaped contagion situation and not an attack, that's fundamentally different as well. And I'm sure that the John, you'll have better analogies on this one than me. I think that your analogy is a very good one. And of course, when you talk about uh, an, es an escaped infection, uh, there are uh, other current ones that immediately jump to our minds, uh, which have had a catastrophic global uh, impact. And we really don't know um, all that, that, uh, that we wish to know about, about that. But no, I think, I think your point is a very good one. We have to be very careful, not just in a, in a kind of grammatically or legally correct sense, but to try to understand the human dimension, not just of individuals, but of governments and of communities behind how they respond. Um, and we need to be prepared to look at ourselves and our own governments and our own communities to see these things, because uh, we shouldn't imagine that it's just the other guys that are using these techniques. So there's one question, um, well, we still have a bunch of questions, but I do want to get to one question here. Um, and I'm going to push back on it a little bit, but this question asks, since there's no body count in the traditional sense in cyber conflict, which, you know, Tara, I think, you know, in your discussion of, um, you know, especially wanna cry, I think that might not be the case. And I, I know in previous conversations, we've talked about this, you know, what are the second and third order effects, right? So if people die as a result of, you know, attacks on hospitals, or what do people die as a result of, um, you know, it, before the vaccine, you know, was really developed, if, you know, if that research was completely wiped out and, and more people died, right? Um, so I'm just pushing back on that particular piece. But how do you propose that we quantify thresholds and establish rules of engagement um, and the breach of those, you know, acceptable behaviors? I'm going to show you what cross-disciplinary uh, uh, collaboration actually looks like, because this conversation is one that we've been having for weeks now, but it, it really came to a head this morning. So you know what? I don't have to anymore, because that answer is found in medical science as well. Would you like to take this one? Well, yes. I mean, th there, there are dilemmas here, because, for example, you might say, well, well, we'll do a body count by looking at the death certificates of people. And if you look at the death certificates, you'll find that so many people died of dementia, so many died of infection, so many died of cancer and so on. But when you start to look at those who've died from, for example, as a result of WannaCry because their ambulance didn't arrive uh, or whatever, well, that's not going to be on the death certificate. So it's actually extremely difficult to assess those kinds of things. Um, and, 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 and you point up a, a very important challenge and problem, Laura. But, you know, it, 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 it's much more serious in a way than that, and it's going to get even more serious because we're now looking at weapons which are going to be authorized and operationalized by artificial intelligence. And so it's not going to be a question of whether or not some commander decides I'm going to fire this shot, or I'm going to instruct that this missile be released. These things are going to be done by artificial intelligence. So where does the attribution go? Um, it, it's very complex. Um, my daughter is a, a lawyer who represents uh, insurance companies in catastrophic personal injury claims. And so a lot of these are, for example, road traffic accidents. And the key question is, uh, well, what did the driver do or not do that resulted in this person being quadriplegic? Well, that's all very fine, but what happens if it's a self-driven vehicle? Uh, is it the person who wrote the software for the computer that's driving the car? Is it the company that designed the car? Is it the person who sold the car? Um, the last person that seems to be responsible is the person who's sitting in the car being driven around by the vehicle. 
uh, which is, of course, exactly the opposite from the way it is currently under law. So it, it's complex enough as it is, but we're only at the beginning of a huge degree of complexity. And that's why having this kind of conversation is important, as long as we don't expect to get the answer at the end of the 90 minutes. <laughs> Absolutely. Um... So I know we're just about time um, and I know there's just so many more things that we could discuss and more questions to have. And so I think this has been such a great discussion to sort of, you know, get this, um, get this started. But I just wanted to kick it to you, both of you have just any short last words and then we'll go ahead and wrap up. It's very kind of you. I, um, I think that my last thought on this is the thought that just because this is a hard problem doesn't make it one we shouldn't be fighting to define and, and wipe out where we can. I came here to the United Kingdom in the middle of a pandemic to sit in a small room an awful lot of the time and visit with the people that I could and see the NHS hospitals, most of them from the outside, that, that I was able to, to look at why we have such a hard time calling something by its right name. And I don't have any hesitance in calling the Russian attack on Kiev, on civilians in the middle of winter, using a cyber weapon, a cyber war crime. I don't have any hesitance calling a North Korean military attack on the United States that spread to the hospitals of the United Kingdom. I don't have any hesitance in calling that a cyber war crime. I don't because it falls under the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court under Article 8. That is what it looks like when a nation state engages in a military attack that targets civilian hospital facilities and the ability of people to feed themselves and stay safe. It is, we need to start calling things by their right names. And it's a dangerous thing when we don't. The closer we can get to truth and the closer we can get to honesty and the closer we can get to coding and identifying people that wish to break the norms without consequences and let civilians pay the price, the closer we're going to get to being able to clearly see a world where we can make something just a little bit better. And just because this is a hard, sticky problem that exists in people's brains as well as in computers and around the world doesn't make it not one that I'll keep trying for. Thank you so much. And it's been an honor, Lauren, I appreciate it. I guess the final comment that I would make coming from my experience at home in Ireland is that people on both sides of the argument felt that they were doing right even when the things that they were doing were wrong, because they were prosecuting for good against evil. But the problem was both sides reckoned that. And if we look at many of the things that the West has done in other parts of the world, they are precisely the things that we are being attacked for now. And those who are attacking us do so because they believe they are justified because of what we did previously. And this is where the law doesn't solve the problem and the technical doesn't solve the problem and where we need to deepen our understanding of the psychological in international affairs. Uh, I, I think that while that might have been intellectually assented to in a country like the United States 10 years ago, I think there is a greater appreciation now about how psychology impacts on domestic politics and leads to people doing things that do not appear to be in the best interests of themselves or others. And on the international stage, it's that to a power. Uh, and uh, I'm keen that we understand we don't have the answers to these things but we need to address the questions if we're going to survive as a species. Wow. Well, thank you both Tara and Lord John Alderdice. This was a really fascinating discussion and I'm so grateful you could be here today to do this. And I wanna just thank everyone who, um, who attended today, who listened to ask questions, um, you know, for participating in this very important conversation. Um, Please remember that, again, um, no part of this recording or anything can be used without the explicit permission um, of our organizers. And uh, I hope to see you on future webinars that we hold. And, and um, if you're not on our email list, please let me know. So thank you, everyone. Please stay safe and healthy and have a wonderful rest of your week. <laughs>